Luke continues in chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. It says, Now while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the end. One of my favorite books is written by Max Lucado. It was called God Came Near. I love how he wrote about this time in a manger. He says, it happened in a most remarkable moment, a moment like no other. For though the segment of time, a spectacular thing occurred, God became man. Divinity arrived. Heaven opened herself up and placed her most precious one in a human womb. The omnipotent in one instant became flesh and blood. The one who was larger than the universe became a microscopic embryo. And he who sustains the world in a word chose to be dependent on the nourishment of a young girl. God came near. He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. Mary and Joseph were anything but royal, yet heaven entrusted its greatest treasure to these simple parents. It began in a manger, this momentous moment of time. He looked anything but like a king. His face was prunish and red. His cry, still helpless and piercing cry of a dependent baby. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of sheep manure and sweat. This baby had overseen the universe. These rags keeping him worn were the robes of eternity. His golden throne room had been abandoned in favor of a dirty sheep pen. And worshiping angels had been replaced with kind but bewildered shepherds. Curious, this royal throne room. No tapestries covering the windows. No velvet garments on the quarters. No golden scepter or glittering crown. Curious, the sounds of the court. Cows munching, hooves crunching, a mother humming, and a babe nursing. It could have begun anywhere, the story of the king. But curiously, it began in a manger. Step into the doorway. Peek through the window. He is here. Would you listen now as we hear away in a manger? Well, Luke now moves from the birth of Christ to the proclamation of his birth. The angels arrive, and when the angels come, they tell us that the Christ, the Savior, 
is born. Luke chapter 2, we keep reading in verse 8. It says, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I can imagine that. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. And this will be the sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a manger. You have these angels proclaiming, Jesus is born. The Savior has come. They are rejoicing. The angels are worshiping. They are excited. I hope you are excited. Would you stand with me and let's sing along with the angels as we sing. Angels, we have heard on high. Well, after the angel decreed this to the shepherds, something magnificent happened. The angel was joined with a whole host of angels. If you could only imagine the scene there on that field as the shepherds were watching their sheep. And first the angel appeared, which in and of itself would have been pretty magnificent. But then a multitude of angels showed up. And the multitude began singing and praising God. Some people say this is about a 10,000 member choir of angels. Can you imagine 10,000 angels? I can't imagine 10,000 people singing and praising God. But 10,000 angels must have been magnificent. Don't you believe? 
Don't you believe that the ground must have shaken with the worship that was going on that day? What a mighty time it must have been to experience. Well, let's read and I hope you feel what happened as the angels proclaim the glory. Luke chapter 2, we keep reading verse 13. Suddenly, there is a multitude, just imagine the multitude. A multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to the people he favors. An angel choir singing praises to God. The ground shaking, the earth trembling, the shepherds in awe as worship was taking place. I want you to join with me, join with us, and worship as if we were those angels. We're not 10,000 this morning. The snow kept everybody away. But those of us who did come, let us worship and rattle the windows right now, okay? Let us join with the angels as we sing. I hope you're listening to some of those words as we were singing and whatever, especially that last verse. That's an exciting verse of why he was born. You know, he was born to give us second birth. He was born so that we may not die. Praise God for all that the angels were proclaiming. Well, now that the angels have proclaimed this message to the shepherds, here's what I really get excited about because now we see the shepherds' response. Again, I can't imagine what my response would have been if the angels showed up and the angels started singing. I mean, the terrified part I get. But next, we see them going, finding Jesus. And then we find the shepherds celebrating. We find the shepherds worshiping. Let's keep reading as Luke puts it in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. He says, Now when the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Well, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. 
And after seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, but Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard, just as they had been told. One of my favorite songs at Christmas time is the one we're about to sing. Because you see, Christmas time is not a time that we just sit back and hold it all in. Christmas time should be the time that we go and tell it, just as these shepherds did. They returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had received and all that they had seen. They went and they told it. Amen. Listen, my prayer for you as you get ready to leave out of here, I ain't even preached yet, but I want you to hear it is that we go and we tell it. Join with me. It's a fun song. Let it all hang out. Go tell it on the mountain. Let's sing it, all right? Go tell it on the Ernest, I don't know, man, I kind of liked being on stage singing the whole time. Although I did instruct, I appreciate Marty for muting my mic the whole time I was up here singing. Actually, you should thank Marty for muting my mic the whole time I was singing. Uh, but I do want to thank you for kind of walking with us this morning through Luke chapter 2 and kind of introducing songs through Scripture. And hopefully you got a little different taste of the Christmas story through the carols that we sing during this Christmas season. I want to continue focusing on Luke chapter 2 today, and I want us to hopefully do the same thing that those shepherds did. I want us to hear the message of the Lord, and after we hear the message of the Lord, respond to the message of the Lord. You see, that's exactly what happened with the shepherds, right? 
I mean, the shepherds were just minding their own business, doing their own thing, when they all of a sudden heard a message from the Lord, and the Lord spoke to them, and the Word of God penetrated their hearts, and when the Word of God penetrated their hearts, they were motivated then to go and to share that same message which that they had heard with others. And in fact, they were telling others, and the response to the others were amazement. And that's what the Bible says. When they heard of this, they were amazed at what the shepherds had heard, at what the shepherds had said. So here's my hope, and here's my prayer for us here at First Chat Baptist today, that we would hear the message of the Lord. Today you will hear the message of the Lord. You'll hear His word. Now what you do with that message, I hope, is that you will follow in the footsteps of the shepherds. And you too will go and tell the message that you have heard. And I hope that as you go and tell, that the people of this city would sit back in amazement at the good news of great joy that we talk about at Christmas time. You see, I believe there are a lot of people who need to hear this good news. There are a lot of people who need to hear and receive this great joy. It's sad and it's heartbreaking to hear and to even see that not everybody is joyful this time of the year. Many are hurt this time of year. Many are depressed during this time of the year. Many people have no hope. They have no peace. They have no joy. But listen, if you're a believer and you know Jesus Christ, then you do have hope. You can have peace, and we should have joy. And we're to share that. We're to talk about that. We're to give that. In fact, I, one of my favorite words in Luke chapter 2, I'll talk about it in a moment, is when the angel came and the angel says, I proclaim to you good news. That word proclaim is the word evangelize. I'm evangelizing you with good news. I'm telling you, I've got some, some stuff to talk to you about that's going to change your life. We are to be evangelists during this Christmas season. To go and to talk about the good news of Jesus. It's not just snow and Santa Claus. It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I hope that this Christmas season, that it's not just bows and ribbons for you, but that it's Jesus. So let us hear the message of the Lord. If you've got your Bibles, I hope you do, grab them and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is not just a moment in history. Luke chapter 2 is really a message, a message to humanity. Luke chapter 2 is the announcement and I love the announcement because it was an announcement in song. This really was a carol of Christmas. And this song, this announcement, was such an amazing announcement. It was such a powerful song that we're still celebrating this announcement 2,000 years later. Even today, we're singing about this song of Christmas. Before I even get into that text, I want to read to you Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7 is one of my favorite verses. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains. Because we go tell it on the mountain. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet. That's not supposed to be feel. Are the feet of him who brings good news. Who publishes peace. Who brings good news of happiness. Who publishes salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. How beautiful are the feet of the people who go and share the gospel. To share the good news of Christ. I pray that you'll have beautiful feet this Christmas season and that we will go and tell people that Jesus Christ is born. So let's jump right in. We kind of have three different kind of subsections that I found in Luke chapter 2. The first part is we see the angels and we see the angels worshiping. You see the angels coming and they're worshiping. Again, if you've got your Bibles in Luke chapter 2 beginning in verse 9, the Bible says this. An angel of the Lord stood before them. And again, we know this already. We've read it as stood before the shepherds. An angel of the Lord stood before them. Now think about this. An, an angel have not been seen before this whole Christmas season, before Mary and before Zechariah. They haven't been seen for hundreds of years. 
No angel had come and visited earth, and now suddenly angels are showing up everywhere. Angels are all over the place. They're visiting Mary. They're visiting Zachariah. They're visiting Elizabeth. Angels are everywhere all of a sudden. Now the shepherds are even seeing angels. Gabriel came and talked to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, and Gabriel came to Mary in Luke chapter 1 as well. You know, evidently Gabriel's one of God's chief messengers. Gabriel was one who spoke to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 verse 16. It's most likely who Gabriel probably came to these shepherds most likely. The, the chief messenger and an angel came, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. You can break that word glory of the Lord. You can kind of search throughout Scripture, see that same terminology, the glory of the Lord. This is the Shekinah glory, the glory that was found in the temple, the glory that was found in the tabernacle. This was the glory of God. This was God's presence. In the Old Testament, God's presence was in the tabernacle. God's presence was in the temple. The glory of the Lord was there with them. Then all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord departed. And for years and for hundreds of years, the glory of the Lord had departed. The glory of the Lord had been gone until now. An angel appeared, and as with the angel, the glory of the Lord appeared. The text goes on, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Again, I think that's the easiest part to understand in this text. As an angel appeared and the glory of God appeared, yes, they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid. And here's the purpose. Why, why am I not afraid? And I love this next part. It says, for look, I proclaim, and this next part is powerful, I proclaim to you. I want you to see how personal this is. I've got something to tell you. I don't know how you come to church. I've got a sermon that I'm going to preach next year. I don't know when I'm going to preach it, but i got it in my pocket i got a sermon I want to preach next year on why you come to church. And part of it is listening and listening to sermons and how to listen to a sermon. And I don't know why you come to church. Maybe it's out of obligation. Maybe it's out of habit. Or maybe it's because you, you need to experience what God has in store for you. I hope that's the reason. But I want you to know this, that I believe, and I truly believe this with all my heart, that God has a message for you each and every Sunday. You, personally, there's something God has for you every Sunday. That's why you should never miss a Sunday. <laughs> because if you miss a Sunday, you might have missed this message for you. So don't miss. <laughs> don't miss. But listen, here's what the angel said. I've, I've got a message for you. A, a shepherd. You. This, this person who's not even allowed to worship in the temple a shepherd not some royalty not some hierarchy a shepherd I've, I've got a message for you and then look at the message I, I love this I, I want to proclaim to you I want to preach to you I want to evangelize to you I've got some good news for you and it's going to bring great joy to you not just you but it's going to be great joy to all people and what is the great news what is this great joy he said this in verse 11 today a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. You see, this is the good news. In fact, the angel gives three different kind of words there used to describe Jesus. The first is that, and we talked about it last week with Mary's song. He says, there's a Savior being born to you. An angel says, listen, let me tell you about this good news. The good news is that a Savior has been born. And this Savior's not only is it good news, it's going to bring about great joy in your life. Now, if there really is sin, and I think there is, if there's any such thing as a sinner, and I believe that there is, the greatest need that we have is the need of a Savior. If sin is real, if sinners are real, then the one thing we need more than anything else is the Savior. That's why it's such good news. Now, he says it's good news that will bring great joy for all people. Why is this such great news for a Muslim? Why is this such good news for a Hindu? Why is this such good news for the rich people? Why is this such good news for the poor people? Because we're all sinners. 
who are in need of a Savior. So he says, this good news is for all people because you are all in the same boat. We're all in need of a Savior. So the angel approached, and the angel says, I've got this good news, and it's for everybody. A Savior has come. Jesus did not come to be a good teacher. Jesus did not come to set an example of good works. Jesus did not come so that he could feed the poor, heal the sick. He came to be a Savior to sinners. That was his purpose. And here the angels begin by saying, a Savior is born. Let me tell you why this is good news. Not everybody who is poor, not everybody is rich, not everybody is sick, but everybody's a sinner. That's why it's important to see that a Savior is born. I need a Savior. You need a Savior. You may not realize it. But I said this last week as we looked at Mary's song. When we see our sin and we see the need of a Savior, we shouldn't be able to contain the worship that's inside of us. When we see our sin and when we see the great Savior, worship should just flow out of us. Let me tell you, if you're having trouble worshiping, I think you're having a trouble seeing the Savior. If you're having trouble worshiping, I think you haven't seen your sin lately. Because when we see our sin and when we see the beauty of the Savior, worship should just flow out of us. It should just overflow. We should just be, be standing in awe of this Savior. Now some of you are saying, well, you know, how is this even true? Is this whole Savior thing the real deal? That leads us to the next title. He says there's a Savior, and my translation says is the Messiah, or maybe your translation says which is the Christ. Messiah or Christ, this is not just some Savior, this is not just the good news, this is also the Messiah, this is also the Christ. This title is especially understood by the Jews. It means the anointed one. Over and over throughout the Old Testament, there was someone promised. There was a rescuer, there was a redeemer, there was a Messiah who was promised. Someone who would come and free them. They were always looking for this one. Who is coming so that we will be free? Who is coming to set us free? It's the Lord's anointed this Messiah here. So when they hear the word Christ, when they hear the word Messiah, I mean, their ears all of a sudden perk up. What? Who? This is him? The one that we've been looking for? The one we've been waiting for? He is here? He has come? Oh my goodness, we can't... He, he's, we can't wait to see him. The promised one. The one who all the prophets have been talking about for years. The one who we've been waiting to see. He's here? Yes. That's the one I'm talking about. A Savior who is Christ. A Savior who is the Messiah. That's who I'm talking about. And again, they must have been in awe at what they were hearing. Well, there's one other title, who, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You see, that last title that the angel uses is the word Lord, and the Hebrew word for Lord is Yahweh, the the word for God that we know. It's the one who's in total charge. Lord means God. So when they heard this word Lord, They didn't just mean a a master. They didn't just mean a, a king. When they heard the word Lord, they understood this as, this is God who was coming. Now some of you, especially if you grew up in church, this is not that big of a deal. You know this. Yes, we know Jesus is God. Let me tell you, this is a big deal. (laughs) That this baby that was born of this woman, a virgin, was not just a Baby boy, this was God. This was God who created the world. I can't can't wrap my mind around it, so I can't even ask you, can you wrap your mind around it? Because I know the answer. No, you can't. But this is God. And whenever they heard this, again, they, they must have been in awe. They are God. The angelic messenger was telling us in the city of David, 
A Savior has been born to you, the Anointed One, the Promised One, who is no other than God Himself. A Jehovah's Witness cannot say that. A Mormon cannot say that. A Muslim cannot say that. They can say Jesus was the Anointed One. They can say that Jesus is a Savior, but none of them will say Jesus is God in the flesh. We do, because it's true. This is what the message the angel presented to us is. That's why the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, he says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, confess with your mouth Jesus is God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's not just a good prophet. He's God himself. God in the flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. Christmas has got some deep stuff to learn, too. But keep reading verse 13. Something amazing happens. And I love this part because here's where the angels worshiping really takes hold. And it says, Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. I'm used to the old King James Version, and I quote it in my head instead of <laughs> reading the Holman. <laughs> For the first time in hundreds of years, this visible glory of God had came down. We've already talked about that. And now these angels, and they come, and they came singing. And again, this word that it says there that praising God is, is just that. It's, it's the same word in the Old Testament in Psalms, especially, that we get the word hallel, hallelujah from. So they're hallelujahing. Is that a word, hallelujahing? They're praising God is what they're doing. And they have these multitude of angels. And again, the multitude, here's the, the largest number in the Greek that they had for. So in there it was 10,000. They didn't know how to count higher than 10,000. I guess it's the largest number they had in place. And, you know, ten, a multitude, as many as you can imagine, praising, hallelujahing. It's hard to say. God. Again, just to have been there. Right? Just to have been there. The angels worshiping, praising God. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. We know what God brings, and God brings peace. God gives peace. I really believe, again, you're here today to receive a message, but you're also here today to go tell a message. And I really believe that this is a message people need to hear today. That we have a God who offers peace. There's a lot of people in our communities, a lot of people in our neighborhoods. Their life is just messed up. And they need peace. And you have an answer for them. You may not realize this, but you have an answer for them. We have a peace that surpasses all understanding. We have a peace available to us that only God can give. This is the declarations of the angels. We have a peace, peace on earth. Again, I don't know what you're dealing with right now. Some of you here today, some of you may be looking and longing for peace. And I'm here to say, just as the angel said, God is offering that peace. Today the angels are singing, this baby, this Savior, this Messiah, this Lord, He has come and He's come to give peace. All you have to do is receive the Prince of Peace. Believe in the Prince of Peace. And then you can have peace. But first, you must have peace with God. In order to do that, as we have a, enter into a right relationship with Him, there's a story. I think I might have time to tell it. I guess I was telling Ernest about it this past Wednesday. The, I don't know how many of you have heard the song. I I heard the bells on Christmas Day. We didn't sing it, but it's kind of got an interesting history. One of America's best known poets, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and that an awesome name. If you could pull that off. He is actually the one who authored this song. 
He composed, I Heard the Bells, on Christmas Day on December the 25th, 1864. Now, the story behind this carol is a tragic one, actually, because you see he did not have an easy life. In fact, he was in his home in his study one day, and his wife and children were in another room, and they were, she was messing around with some wax and all this stuff. All of a sudden, some wax fell on her dress. As the wax fell on her dress, some fire jumped from the candle onto her dress and began burning her up. Now she couldn't put out the flame, and her dress started going up in flames. The house caught on fire. She ran into the other room with her husband, and he saw that his wife was on fire. So he grabbed her, and he tried to put it out. He laid her on, her, laid on top of her, and they rolled around. And Well, ultimately, the next day, she died because of her burns, and he was very badly burned. In fact, he was so badly burned that he couldn't even go to her funeral. He was just at home. But to make matters worse, this was also during the Civil War. During the Civil War, his oldest son decided to join the army, and as he joined the army, he got injured. He got injured in the spinal cords. In fact, it was such a bad injury that he couldn't, he couldn't take care of himself. So for the rest of his life, his father had to take care of him. So he had to watch over his son for the rest of his life. Well, in fact, uh, 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 listening to some of the words that he wrote, in December 25th, 1862, two years before he wrote the song, he wrote this, A Merry Christmas, children say, but no more for me. It'll never be merry. Well, two years later, he sat down, and he finally was just pouring his heart out to the Lord, and he says, maybe if I start writing poetry again, it'll heal my soul. So he wrote this, the first stanza of, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. It says this, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. A wild and sweet, the words repeat, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And that lifted his spirit some. But then he stopped and he started again thinking about his life. His children who were there and paralyzed. And his wife who was not there to help. His wife who had died. And he sat down and he wrote again another line. And he says this. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks this song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You can almost just hear in his heart, can't you, just the breaking of his heart. Look at my life, he says. There is no peace. Look at what I'm going through. Why do they say peace on earth? It's not real. Well, he didn't stop there. He gathered his thoughts, and he sat down, and he wrote the last stanza of this song. The last stanza goes like this. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God's not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. It's really an awesome song. It's a song that starts high, goes low, but ends with the highest of highs. God's not dead. He will prevail. God is alive. He is the answer. My life stinks right now, but praise God, He's the one who can give peace that I can't understand. Can you hear this guy who had battled many tragedies? But even in the tragedies, he knew where to look. He was looking to the Lord the one who could truly give peace. Interesting song. Next time you hear that, think about the story behind the song. I want to kind of ask you, will you come to him today? Will you receive that peace from him today? Well, not only is the angels worshiping, there's another group of people who are worshiping. It's the shepherds. You see, the shepherds begin worshiping too. We read it a moment ago, but in verse 15 and 16, of Luke chapter 2, it says, And when the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Well, let's go straight to Bethlehem. I'm glad they decided not to take a break. Let's go straight to Bethlehem, as if they were going to make a detour. 
Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off. Again, they didn't drag around. They hurried off. By the way, I told you let's mimic the, the, the shepherds today. So if we're going to mimic the shepherds, can you listen to some of these verbs that, that we see here? One is let's go straight to Bethlehem. They had a focus. They knew where they needed to go. I want to say this to you right now. There's some people that you need to go to this holiday season. You need to just go straight to them. Don't be dragging around, waiting, making up excuses. Go. You got a neighbor, you got some family members, you got a friend, you got somebody at school, go to them. Go straight to them. Don't be dragging around. Secondly, you see that? They hurried off. Don't be waiting. I will next week. I will next month. I will when it's more convenient. Hurry up. Anyway, that's not the message. I'll move on. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. So they saw that. The announcement basically happened, and I, I like one guy by the name of Brock. He said this. He said, the shepherd's action set off an evangelistic chain reaction. <laughs> you kind of see a chain reaction taking place. They, they went to Bethlehem. They saw the manger. And after they saw the manger, they saw the baby. As they saw the baby, they went and told people. Then they went back home, and they kept glorifying. They kept praising. You kind of see what was taking place here. Over and over, they kept, kept getting excited. You, you see this in the shepherd's. Now, first, first of all, I want you to see that, that they went looking. Do you notice this? The, the shepherds, they, they went looking. Verse 15 and 16 said, let's go. Let's, let's go straight to Bethlehem. Let's look for this. So they, they hurried, or maybe your translation said they came with haste. They didn't wait around. And when they came to Bethlehem, they saw exactly what the angels said they would see. Which leads to the second point, and the one that we'll hopefully leave here with. Not only did they go looking, but they went, left, sharing. What I mean by they left sharing is they heard the message, saw the Christ, and then they had to go tell people about what they had just seen. Look at verse 17 and verse 18. After seeing them... They reported the message that they were told about this child, and all who heard it, I love that word all, I mean, it sounds like more than one, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They left, and I can imagine on their way as they had left the manger, on the streets, in the market, all the, they were telling everybody they came in contact with what they had seen and who had told them. Now, I'm sure people thought they were crazy. We just saw angels singing in the sky. That's weird. We just saw a baby who is the Messiah. Makes no sense. Yet it didn't stop them at all. In fact, uh, no wonder the people were amazed. They were like, these guys are nuts. These guys are crazy. Can you go tell people this week what you have heard? what you have seen. Can you tell people about the good news of Christmas? And so what if they think you're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? Who cares? doesn't matter. Just go tell them. Go tell them the good news. Go tell them what Jesus has done, who Jesus is. And if they're amazed or wondered, as the ESV put it, so be it. Let people see you just obeying what we're supposed to do. So last week I asked you about Mary and about Mary's song. I asked you, are we going to let Mary sing along? Is she going to be the only one singing? Or are we going to join her in praise? I want to ask you the same thing about the shepherds. Are we going to let the shepherds be the only one who go and tell it? Or will we join with them this Christmas season? Will we join with the shepherds and sing a song about a Savior? And go tell the good news that brings great joy to all people? Because without a doubt, we have people in this city who need to hear that, right? So let us go. Which leads to the last point today is our worship. Our response. 
as you have heard the message of the Lord, I wonder what you are going to do with it. How will you respond? The shepherds, they didn't return the same way as when they had left. They were changed dramatically. In fact, did you notice at the end of Luke 2 there that we read how they came back? What was it, verse 20? The shepherds returned, and notice what they, how they returned. They returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard. They were not the same group of shepherds. When they had returned, they came back glorifying and praising God. It's almost like I think they had a new song in their heart. They had good news that they had to share. Keep quiet. They couldn't. Not a chance. So what do they do? What must we do? Two things. First is this. We glorify God where we live, where we are. Do you see that? It says they returned. Where did they return to? They went back to the field. Did you notice that? The shepherds went back to where they were. They went back to the field. They went back to the sheep. Now, I guess they were singing to the sheep. That's fine. But they went back to where they were. And here's the thing for you. I believe this, and you've heard me say this in the past. God has placed you where you are for a purpose. So, glorify God where you are. There are people you work with that I'll never come in contact with. There are people in your neighborhood that I'll never see. Glorify God where you are. The second is this. Praise God for what you have. They glorified and praised God for what they had seen and what they had heard. They had received something amazing. They had received an angel that proclaimed to them good news, and they gave God glory for that. My goodness, what do you have? Have you been blessed by the Lord? Have you received the good news of Jesus? Praise God for that. We must not be silent. If you're saved and you're silent, you're crazy. We must not be silent. If we're saved, we must shout. Sing a new song to the Lord. Shout to the heavens all the good news. We must praise God for what we have. I have a gospel inside of me. I have good news inside of me. And I cannot, I must not keep it inside. I've got to share it. It's, a, it's exploding inside of me. I've got to get rid of it. There's a... Somewhere in my front of my Bible, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, it says this, His message becomes a fire burning within my heart, shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in. I love that verse. I got a message inside of me, and, I, uh, and it's like a fire burning within me. I cannot keep it within. I got to let it out. Are you like that? Do you have a message? Do you have something inside of you like a fire that's burning inside of you that you cannot keep in? You've got to let it out. That's the Christmas story. I come to you with good news of great joy. That's for all people. There's a Savior, a Messiah. It's Christ the Lord. Will you... Go and tell it. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I pray that as we have sat here and heard a message, much like the angels told the shepherds, and the shepherds heard the message and responded. They responded by going and seeing, receiving, and then they left sharing, telling the good news. May we too do the same. God, I pray for people here today that they would receive this good news. That today that they would receive this good news of great joy. Maybe for some it's receiving it for salvation. They've never fully given their life to you. As I spoke about having a message burning inside of you, they couldn't identify. They've never received that message. they never received the good news. Today I pray that they would Surrender their life to you as Savior and Lord and give their life to you. 
God, may we be a witness to this city. May we go to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our friends, to our family, and tell them the good news of Christmas. May we not keep it inside. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.